Welcome, uh, everybody, to the 13th uh, edition of our COVID-19 series for the Royal Society of Medicine. We're very lucky this morning to have two very eminent professors, uh, Professor Sir Michael Rawlins, uh, Chairman of the MRHA and uh, past President of the Royal Society of Medicine, and Professor Sir Stuart Rolston, uh, who is Chairman of the CHA. So, uh, Mike, uh, you take over now and uh, let's see how things go. Thank you. Um, it, uh, it, it's a great pleasure to be here. And, uh, and I have uh, a number of questions for Stuart Ralston. The first question is very briefly, Stuart, could you tell us about the role of the CHM, the Commission on Human Medicines, which you chair? Certainly, Sir Michael. So the CHM, advises the, the MHRA on matters relating to the safety, efficacy and quality of drugs. Um, the, the CHM has about 25 members, but it's work supported by several expert advisory groups from all disciplines. And so we're involved not only in looking at new drugs that might uh, become up for license, but also safety signals of existing drugs and you know, drugs that might be used in clinical trials. Hi. And what role has the CHM, broadly speaking, in this COVID-19 uh, pandemic played? Thanks. Well, I think like many government departments, like many people in the NHS, we have been working very hard at the moment to try and deal with this uh, pandemic. Um, we've been able to fast track applications for new clinical trials and new drugs that might be useful in the condition. Um, we've also had to carry on the normal work of looking at the licensing of normal drugs, looking at safety signals as well. So I, I think probably like many people, we've been doing double the work that we normally do, but uh, trying to get through it as best we can. Excellent, excellent. Now, um, there are a whole spe number of very specific questions, Stuart, for you. First of all, have you or your commission uh, had any, expressed any views about the use of uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and the symptomatic treatment. Um, pe people are told to take para paracetamol, but what about ibuprofen? It, some people are claiming it's dangerous. Yeah, thanks for that. Well, the, the ibuprofen story really came from very, I think it was an offhand comment from the French Minister of Health that it may be dangerous. It wasn't really based on any information, in fact. Uh, and in fact, so the MHRB did a review of this area and together with NICE, we really found no evidence that ibuprofen would uh, worsen uh, the severity of COVID or, or in fact, uh, make you more susceptible to COVID. So, um, so drugs like ibuprofen, we think, can be taken if necessary. Of course, you don't want to take any drug unless you need it, but they can be taken if necessary uh, for symptoms. And, and certainly if you're on that for arthritis or whatever, you, you shouldn't stop it uh, because of this scare. Yeah. And, uh, um, the next, my next question to you is that there's been suggestions that patients who are taking ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, or an angiotensin receptor blockers, um, might be at greater risk of either developing uh, uh, COVID-19 or would have more severe conditions. Have you got any views on this? Yeah, thanks. Well, again, um, that uh, was a thought that might be true <coughs> of the association between COVID and hypertension, where it's known that hypertension is a risk factor. But there have been a couple of pretty large uh, observational studies, clinical studies, which really have shown no association between ACE inhibitors or ARBs and severity of COVID. So I think that is unfounded. And then, of course, these drugs are very important. If you've got hypertension or heart failure, um, if you get diabetes at risk of kidney disease. And, and so really, I think patients on those drugs have nothing to fear from continuing with right. them and they, right. in fact, it would, they would be disadvantaged as it were if they stopped absolutely yeah okay now um clinical trials of vaccines um have you been uh, involved in the authorization of vaccine trials <clears throat> yes indeed uh, as with all trials the chm and its uh, clinical trials uh, biologicals and vaccines eag was very closely involved in that um, as uh, people attending the webinar probably know, uh, the Oxford vaccine is in clinical trial just now. It's a, a DNA vaccine. It's an adenovirus-based vaccine. I'm aware in the United States, there's an RNA-based based vaccine that's in clinical trials, and there's a lot of other clinical trials. 
uh, or a lot of other vaccines in development. Uh, but it will be very interesting to see how those go, obviously, but it's early stages as yet. Then. Yeah. And any, any thoughts on how long it will be before we have a, an effective vaccine for all of us? Ah, uh, a difficult question. Well, if we take the Oxford vaccine, the phase one trial is in progress. Obviously, they're going to be looking at safety. They're going to be looking at antibody responses. I mean, I'm an optimistic kind of guy. I'm hoping maybe uh, start of next year, we might have something if it, if it pans out. I think there will be a vaccine. I'm confident there will be a vaccine. Um, and uh, the exact time scale, I have to say, I can't be ex absolutely sure of yeah, Sure. Now, there's been a number of, I want to move on to, to, to treatments, uh, therapeutic agents that would uh, uh, be, as it were, uh, either not be curative necessarily, but would uh, ameliorate the, uh, uh, the consequences of infections with COVID-19. So first of all, there's been quite a bit of talk about chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, not least from the President of the United States. Thank you. Well, um, you've got the French to blame for chloroquine again. <laughs> there was a very small study in France which suggested that it may have efficacy. To be quite honest, it was a very poor study, poorly defined. You couldn't really make anything of it. But based on that, there, there was interest in chloroquine. There is some data from cell culture experiments that it may have an effect. Um, there's certainly no evidence at present that either chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine is effective, although there are many trials. In fact, that's one of the drugs that's being studied in the big UK trial, the recovery trial, as one of the arms has hydroxychloroquine in it. And that trial's enrolled a lot of patients. So I, I think we will know quite soon uh, about the efficacy of, of hydroxychloroquine. But certainly at the moment, I, I wouldn't urge people to take chloroquine or, or hydroxychloroquine unless they're being prescribed. But certainly if you're taking a part in a clinical trial, yes, of course, uh, that's perfectly fine. Fine, thank you. Now, what about azithromycin? Again, I don't really understand why azithromycin might be effective, but yeah, uh, we didn't talk about it. I mean, that came from the same French study. And as, as mentioned, it's a very poor study. Azithromycin, so far as I'm aware, isn't antiviral. No, I exactly. guess some, uh, some of these patients uh, with COVID can get secondary bacterial infection, so it might help for that. And again, um, that, has been that has been trialed within recovery. And, and actually, there are other trials uh, across the world that are using azithromycin, both alone in combination. So, so again, it's not something that should be prescribed I believe off-label, but it, it is in clinical trials, and of course we will know when the results of those come through if it's likely right. to be effective. Now the next one uh, is is an antiviral, remdesivir, which I think was originally developed for Ebola. Hmm. Yeah, remdesivir is an interesting one. It inhibits RNA polymerase, and it, um, uh, COVID is an RNA virus, so there's a good biological uh, basis for its use. There are uh, preclinical data, cell culture data. We don't really have much clinical trial data. There was a trial in China which showed a little bit of, of benefit in terms of hospital admission, but certainly no benefit in terms of mortality. There has been a big US study um, showing apparent claims of benefit, but um, th that trial hasn't fully reported. So, and, and remdesivir is being used in, I think, two or three trials in the UK. So it's an agent that shows some promise, but certainly um, we don't know if it's effective as yet. Right. Now, what about uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, lopinavir and ritinavir? Okay, thank you. So both of those drugs are licensed for the treatment of HIV. They're what's called protease inhibitors. And um, a lot of viruses, RNA viruses and other viruses, use proteases to kind of reproduce and, and do their stuff. Um, I think those two drugs, they were very much designed to target HIV. So they've been, they've been targeted against HIV. Um, they haven't really been designed to target the, the COVID proteases. So it's possible they may work, but, um, but as I say, they're, they're but because they were available, I think that's the reason why they've been entered into clinical trials. Trials so far haven't shown a big effect of those drugs. Whether it will pan out, who knows? Again, that, is, that combination is being uh, trialed in the discovery study and actually many other studies. Fine. Now, <coughs> turning to uh, um, uh, 
other sorts of treatment, it's been suggested that steroids and other immunosuppressive agents might be helpful. Okay, thank you. So as a rheumatologist, I'm very interested in this because we use a lot of these drugs in our patients um, to dampen down inflammation in rheumatoid and in lupus and so on. And, and it's a paradox that on one hand, these drugs might make you more open potentially uh, to infection, but yet are being used to treat it. Um, the, the rationale though stems from the fact that in patients who are severely affected, they do seem to get this what's called cytokine storm. They have very severe lung disease, a lot of cytokines being produced. And, and we know that these drugs can be helpful in that situation. So certainly the trials I've seen, they aren't being used in people early on in the stage of the disease, certainly wouldn't want to use them in, in eight mildly symptomatic people, but in people more severe who really are critically ill, there is a, a, a certainly a biological basis for trying them out. There's a lot of trials going on. Tocilizumab is one that's anti-IL-6. That has recently been added to recovery as an arm. It's been trialed in another study. So there is a basis for it, but, but again, we, we need to wait to see if these drugs work. But you can always think of a reason why they might work, but yes. until but, you actually do the study, you don't know. Yes. Yes, and, uh, and, and the, 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 the interferons are inhaled, isn't that right? Yeah, interferon, inhaled interferon has, this was initially in recovery, uh, but they, they took it out, I think, because there were trouble getting the product. But it's, uh, there's a trial ongoing in Europe, I think, with inhaled interferon, and probably another trial in, in the UK. I, I'm sorry to lack the detail, but there are literally so many trials of so yes, many yeah. drugs in this condition. It's really difficult to keep pace. But, yes. but yeah, it is inhaled interferon that's being yeah. looked at. And then the other treatment uh, that is being uh, considered is, is convalescent plasma. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, again, that's recently been added to recovery. So the theory with that is that if you're convalescing from COVID, you will have antibodies to the virus. In, in your serum, and that might help as a therapeutic. Um, it is being trialed, uh, it's quite at an early stage. I, I have to say, I'm not directly involved in the recovery trial. I don't know if any patients have been treated with that, but National Blood Transfusion have been very much involved in, in sourcing the material, and obviously donors who have had COVID very uh, uh, kindly are helping to donate. So it, it's, it's an interesting line, an interesting therapeutic approach, and. Here's hoping it might work, but we don't know. Yeah. If it might work. And, but and just to follow up a bit, um, would any old convalescent plasma, or would it be from people who had severe infections? <clears throat> the evidence I'm aware of suggests that if you've had a severe infection, you have a more marked immune response and therefore produce more antibody. Um, I'm not an expert in this area, I have to say, but people with a more severe infection seem to make more antibodies and theoretically, uh, might be expected to that might be better but but who knows like like i say we, we don't really know if that if that works or yeah, not but it, it would sort of make sense wouldn't it yes. the, yeah, the, the more the, 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 yeah the, the more you've got the the more effective in theory one would expect it to be yeah there's certainly a rational basis for that it is just antibodies though remembering that our immune system not involved not only involves antibodies from b cells but also t cell mediated immunity so you, you know, it, 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 if a vaccine was found, for example, it, it, it may be more effective because it, it would uh, hopefully activate both parts of your immune system. Good. Now, we've had a, a fair number of questions from the, from the audience or the public, or, um, and uh, I can't possibly go and ask you all, all of them, but some of them. Uh, so uh, the first one I want to ask you about is a question, shouldn't antiviral drugs like remdesivir uh, be tested on patients before they get very ill? Okay, <clears throat> well, uh, my stance on that is that it, it's much better to give these drugs within a context of a clinical trial. The reason is you don't know if it's going to have any benefit. Yeah. There has been some use of remdesivir, so-called, um, um, in, in with where all, option, all other options has failed. But I think it's important that these drugs are properly trialed because all drugs can do harm as well as good. Sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm not in favor of that. And I think I'm- The much question there was, why don't we do trials in people who are less ill before they get very ill? Okay, um, that's a, it's a tricky one. From the data we have though, it seems that the, a lot of the, probably the vast majority of people with COVID 
um, or have a mild illness. And if you look at the data from Iceland, where they did a lot of testing early on, it looked like 50% of people who had it had no symptoms at all. Um, most people had a kind of mild flu-like illness, but nothing to speak of. So to give treatments which might be like, <coughs> effective and maybe toxic in these people with mild illness, I think it, it doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, what about treatments for children, pediatric patients? Yeah, <clears throat> well, um, luckily children are not often affected no, no. by COVID. There's, there, is, uh, there are reports of this illness. It's, it has similarities to a, a, a type of vasculitis called Kawasaki. Yes, I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking of children who get the straightforward one. Yeah, well, again, you wouldn't need to. You, I don't think that children would need treated. Um, um, if they had severe, could, could sorry? You, if they had severe infections, some, you know, and a few of them do, could, do we need to do a clinical trial or could we just adjust those dates by weight? Yeah, ideally, I think you would want to use data emerging from clinical trials. I have several times in the webinar mentioned the recovery trial, which has enrolled, I think, nearly 10,000 patients. Yeah. And I expect data from that trial will be coming available very soon, um, one way or another, if a treatment is, is, is looking good or not. So I think, again, with children, it would be better to wait for the results of the trials. But of course, in the UK, physicians, pediatricians, if they feel a treatment, maybe steroids or whatever, is, is, is likely to be beneficial, they, they can use the, that treatment in, in, yes. in an individual patient. Yes, absolutely. And uh, um, uh, uh, of course, a lot of the medicines that are used in children have not actually been licensed for use in children. Uh, my pediatric friends tell me about 50% of the drugs they use. So one could see it happening, even if it hadn't been licensed. Exactly. So that, that would come down very much to the experience and the clinical judgment of the pediatrician in charge. I mean, luckily, we are moving or have already moved to a situation whereby when new drugs come forward for licensing, whether for any indication, there has to be what's called a pediatric implementation plan, where yeah. the company that's making the drug has to have plans if the condition affects children to look at uh, the condition in children with that drug. And um, it's extremely important uh, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, the, the next question I've, that we've been asked is, uh, uh, if COVID-19 drug trials come with positive results for any product, how quickly can UK patients benefit? Thank you. The answer is very quickly. Um, the MHRA and the CHM is very highly tuned up to look at all new data arising from clinical trials wherever they are in the world, not only the UK. Yeah. And if promising data comes from any drug, um, wherever it's being trialed, then we're in a position to look at that, decide is the data good enough to gain a license, which obviously is 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 the, the, one of the ways forward. So we're very geared up to do that. And um, nothing has come as yet, uh, which has reached that threshold. But if it does, uh, we will be able to move very quickly on it. So I mean, it's a very similar question. I'm not sure you need to answer it, but there's also a very similar question. Why are we ignoring other countries' experience and they want to wait for our own trials uh, during the crisis, uh, which has already had 3,200 deaths? I think the point you're making is that you don't mind where the studies are done, in a sense. Uh, you, want, you want to look at them and see if, they're, uh, 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 if, if the results uh, are, uh, uh, seem to be uh, reliable. Absolutely. And it, it already the, the, the MHRA, the CHM and the ad hoc group, where we have a, set up a special ad hoc group to look specifically at the results of trials in COVID, and that's chaired by Professor John Friedland from St. George's. And um, they have been looking at data from all trials over the world, China, Hong Kong, US, everywhere. So we're most certainly not ignoring uh, data uh, just because it's not generated in the UK. Right, right. Fine. Uh, there's one or two other sort of questions. Uh, somebody suggested... Uh, 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 that, that uh, uh, somebody's asking uh, about vitamin D and C. Are okay. they protectors? 
Um, if I could deal with vitamin D, I mean, vitamin D has been mooted. Uh, the reason being, COVID is more severe in older people, and of course, where vitamin D deficiency is common. And, and, and the BAME group, um, it, it, COVID is more severe, where vitamin D is more common. Um, so there, there's a, there, there's, it has been said, well, maybe uh, vitamin D deficiency is making COVID worse. All I would say is there isn't any evidence that vitamin D supplementation would prevent COVID or reduce its severity. However, that could be an area uh, worthwhile looking at in a clinical trial. And it certainly uh, would not be difficult to do. Vitamin D um, widely available. It has a good therapeutic margin. I certainly wouldn't advise people taking vitamin D to prevent COVID or treat COVID. But if someone wanted to come up with a clinical trial to look at it, I think that could be interesting. Right. Well, vitamin C, I'm not aware of any data on vitamin C, to be quite honest. And, and rather than necessarily do a clinical trial, what about uh, looking at vitamin D levels, plasma levels, in patients who have got either severe or died from it? Yeah. Could, if, if they were significantly lower than ones who didn't get such complications? It wouldn't take you all that much further, uh, I think. The reason is low vitamin D levels have been associated with so many illnesses. Um, I mean, practically every illness has been associated with low vitamin D levels. And of course, what happens is if you're ill, you don't get out, you might not be eating so well and your vitamin D level goes down. So it's what, what's called reverse causation, which I'm sure many of our uh, yes. audience will be familiar with. So that wouldn't be proof enough. Um, and, but there, and, and in fact, there, there was a recent large trial where uh, vitamin D was looked at in preventing diabetes if you looked at the observational studies, you'd have been convinced that vitamin D deficiency caused diabetes. But in fact, uh, this trial, which was published not long ago, showed no, no effect of vitamin D. So, so I think it's a reasonable suggestion, but, um, but I think we would have to see trial data before it could be recommended. Okay, uh, another, one, of the, one of the other uh, uh, members of our audience have asked about BCG. Um, I can't see a reason, I noticed that, I can't see a reason why that would help. Um, obviously, that is to do with Trebek. I can't see a reason why that would help, I mean. No, I, I can't see it either, but I just wondered if I was, I'd miss something. Uh, uh, there's somebody claiming that uh, azithromycin does actually uh, have antiviral effects on the bronchial epithelial cells. But. Okay, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that data. Um, I mean, nitro, azithromycin is um, an antibiotic. It's used in people with cystic fibrosis bronchiectasis. Again, maybe may, even if so, um, it, we would need to see the efficacy in this particular situation. And I know that, for example, indomethacin, there's another drug, it's an anti-inflammatory drug, there are studies in vitro to suggest it may inhibit viral replication, um, not of, of, of COVID, uh, this type of COVID, but, but again, we, um, there's certainly no evidence for indomethacin, for example, as, as a therapeutic. Yes, yes, and that was another question, actually, that one, one of our audience uh, asked. Um, and then, finally, um, there's talk about regulatory relaxation. What do you understand by that term? Well, I think. Are you we cutting are corners? Is that the first of all, asking? Yeah, first of all, the priority of the MHRA, the CHM, is to make sure medicines are safe. We are not cutting corners by no means. But where um, we can do, if we, if we, if we think that it, it's possible to take steps to review a clinical trial application or get a, a medicine licensed in the quickest way we possibly can. Then, then that's what we're going to do. So we're speeding things up, but we're not cutting the corners. And I think that the public can be reassured that if we come to a stage where a medicine is licensed for COVID, I very much hope it will be, um, then it will have undergone the thorough uh, uh, scrutiny by the authorities and they can rely on the medicine agent being safe. Yeah, and, and they can be confident uh, that you've given your independent, not a government view, but your independent view, when I say you, I mean the commission, uh, about the safety, quality, efficacy. 
That's absolutely right. Thank you, Sir Michael. Yes. Not at all. But just before you go, before we finish, I want to make you blush. <laughs> and I want to make not just you blush, I want to make uh, all our colleagues at the MHRA uh, and all these supporting uh, individuals in EAGs and so on. Because uh, two and a half weeks ago, the Secretary of State made the following comment in the House of Commons. And it's all in Hansard if you need to put it on your wall at home or wherever. Um, and what he said was, the innovative groups of people at both the Jenner Institute in Oxford and the regulator, the MHRA, deserve special praise. They are ensuring the process is safe yet conducted more rapidly than ever before. They deserve the support of the whole house in the work they do. Well, that is very nice to know. And I hadn't, I hadn't actually realized that, but great. Um, yeah, as I said, it, it's in Hansard and uh, you can uh, frame it and put it up on the wall of your study or whatever you like. But thank you, Stuart, that's very good. And uh, I'll hand you back, hand us back to uh, uh, the president-elect. Thank you, well, thank you, Sir Michael. Not at all. Well, thank you, both of you, uh, for that fantastic overview. You know, everybody's asking questions about uh, these drugs, and maybe they, uh, one of them, when we have the evidence, uh, will uh, show us the way out of this uh, problem, massive problem that we have uh, right now. So this is just, uh, I I'm the referee blowing the final whistle, and just to remind you that our ongoing COVID-19 series uh, uh, happens again next week, next Tuesday at 12.30 uh, precisely, where on Tuesday we'll be discussing international aspects of COVID from uh, Malta and from uh, other places abroad. And then on Thursday, we're addressing that issue which uh, was mentioned by Sir Michael, the susceptibility of BAME patients, black and uh, minority ethnic patients uh, for this disease. I should also member, uh, mention that uh, our uh, president, Sir Simon Wesley, on Wednesday evening next week is interviewing Jane Corbyn, a most uh, extraordinary investigative journalist who's reported uh, on uh, 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 Afghanistan uh, uh, and uh, Iraq and uh, many other places in the, in the Middle East and beyond. Uh, and also uh, recently run a panorama program uh, about COVID in the NHS. So thank you. Uh, both of our speakers, thank you for uh, our very attentive listeners, all those wonderful questions coming in. These uh, recordings will be available on our RSM Live website and uh, 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 permanently actually. So we're building up a series of information by professionals for professionals from the Royal Society of Medicine. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you.